Amen. The song is entitled The Going Home Medley for the song What a Day That Will Be and the King is Coming. Again, 
Amen, amen, and amen. This morning, I do want to give you our announcements. Our announcements are as follows. We do want to remind you, Sunday morning, we do have our Sunday morning service at 9 a.m. We have an early service uh, for those that are, uh, or especially those that can't make it out to the 11th service, 11 a.m. service. Uh, that's, that was amazing this morning. We do also have a 10 a.m. Bible study, and uh, that is tremendous. Uh, I think uh, for the next few uh, weeks, you can hardly just be uh, elaborating on some more strong points and doctrine. You definitely want to come out and get a blessing uh, in that area as well. And also, we do have our 11 a.m. service, which we do now, but this evening, we do have our evening service at 7 p.m. We ask that you be uh, in your places there, continue to be uh, much in prayer, uh, be in places there. And then this week, uh, we also want to remind you of our prayer meeting, Bible study time, that's at 7.30 p.m. right here on Wednesday. Uh, so we want you to be here on time uh, to get those. And we do have a prayer uh, sheet uh, that I think the ushers have given out with the bulletin. Uh, so you can be praying for those all through the week. And uh, definitely we want to hear you come back with some praises as well as some prayer requests. And then also we want to remind you of Friday of our Youth Fund Fellowship at 7 p.m. right here at the church. And on Saturday, Soul Winning, we're in the Peter Street area. I want you to come along and join us this coming Saturday. I had a tremendous time uh, yesterday. We want to continue to go out and continue to plow in those areas. Uh, those are some fruitful grounds, and uh, we definitely got some good prospects in there. Uh, so continue to be much in prayer as we uh, go down through Peter Street and, and then hit the other streets as we go on. But we're sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus. And so those are the announcements. I know there are others. Definitely can get those from the deacon or the pastor. At this time, you can have. Let's stand and take our Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 38. Psalm chapter 38. for Pastor Kwame and his family as they uh, see he's going and doing some evangel evangelism work. He's going and reaching many churches. God is working in his life to doing basically a new thing. So continue to pray for him and see his churches are doing the will of God. You found us, amen. Amen. All right, now we need the first read the song. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thy arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand pressed in me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thy anger, neither there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For thy iniquities are all over my head, as I have heard in the day. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly. I go morning all day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore, and I have brought by reason of the strife in my heart. Lord, all my desires before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. It's my heart, my heart, my lovers and my friends stand aloft from my soul. And my kinsmen stand far, far off. They also that seek after my life, they care for me. And they that seek my hurt, speak the serious things, and imagine the seek all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heard not, and moved not the proofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Though thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. For I say, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice with me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my liberty, I will be sorrow for my sin. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate my wrong hate me wrongfully. I multiply. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Together, make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. 
Ms. Regan of Broadway, if you may be seated. Let's ask our ushers to please come for the sporting tithes and offerings. We will remind you to be faithful to giving commissions. We know that that is considered the heartbeat of God. To spread the word of God through missions. So we ask that you continue to be mindful to give unto the work of missions. Let's ask for the Virgin to please pray for the offering. Father, thank you that we can come in your house once again to worship your wonderful and mighty Jesus in name. We pray, Lord, for those who are here, no doubt, heavy hearted. We pray, Lord, that they lay everything on the altar today. We pray that you fill your mind, serving with power from on high, as you proclaim your word, and your souls be saved and Christianly edified. Bless the offering that they use for the further of us, in Jesus' name.
Let's turn right over to 538 right before I'm about to come. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more did he give? Seated. You may be seated. 
We're going to read Psalm 1, I'm just going to read that. And then we're going to proceed from there. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Two men, two ways, two destinies. When we think of what it's all about, um, this is a beautiful book called the Book of Psalms. We love it. It's one of those books that uh, we use over and over. There's so much to be said, and I'm going to get through this as quickly as I can. We have a baptism after the service, and we want to get to that. It is said that more songs have been written from the Psalms than any other book in the world. It is also said that the Psalms have, have furnished the theme for bridal hymns and battle songs and, and prayers and public readings and uh, public marches. It is said that the book of Psalms is the middle book of the Bible. And basically, when you look at the book of Psalms, you come to 100, Psalm 119, it's kind of like almost the center there, and, um, of, of the Bible that is. And um, the Psalm 119 is a psalm that every verse in it relates to the Word of God. And I think that's just fitting that the Word of God has at the center, the Word of God. Um, when we look at the book of um, Psalms, we look at the writers. We have writers like David. King David wrote 73. Solomon wrote 2. Hezekiah wrote 10. Moses wrote nine, uh, 1. Psalm 90. Korah wrote 12. Asaph wrote 12. Ethan wrote, wrote 1. Psalm 89. Uh, Heman wrote 1. Psalm 88. There are also some 39 orphanic psalms. That is psalms that we don't know who the author is. When you look at the Psalms, the Psalms are basically Jewish in nature. It has to do with Jewish style of worship, the temple, etc., etc. But it, it has application to us. But we need to know that the nature of it is it, it's Jewish in its concept. There are several divisions in the Psalms. There is Pilgrim Psalms, Imprecatory Psalms. Those are Psalms where they pray some dangerous prayers, we call them. Let him bring the pray to bring the judgment down on the different folks or the enemies. The messianic psalms, which is called um, psalms that refer to Jesus Christ. Well, that, that is that is mentioned in the New Testament concerning Christ. Some sixteen of them. But I like how Doctor Vernon McGee placed it, like I mentioned last week. He said, you know what? Every psalm and a psalm means a song. It's a hymn. But he said the real him is H I M. It, it psalm is about him. It's about Jesus. So it's very important. Uh, the penitential psalms, psalms in which you know they're praying. Halil psalms, acrostic psalms, pilgrim psalms I mentioned, Puritan psalms, historic psalms, nature psalms, uh, missionary psalms. It is said that the key word in the book of Psalms is the word Hallelujah. You know that means praise the Lord. And some believe that it will be the key chapter would be Psalm 150. And so within uh, some 13 times in, in six verses, you have Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Psalms. We read it often. I was coming on the plane yesterday, dashed over on uh, Friday morning to Tabernacle and came back Saturday morning. First flight went over 7 o'clock, came back 7 something. And uh, this lady was sitting on the side of me and she pulled out a Bible and she began to read. And she pulled out a Bible and I said, Miss, I said, that's the greatest book in the universe. 
she said, yes, yes, I believe it. I didn't want to disturb her. She opened the Bible and she began to read from the book of Psalms. Some people believe in the book of Psalms. They, they, they read that for their devotions. It is said that there are some 126 psychological experiences that mankind can experience. I don't know how they come up with that figure. 126 psychological experiences. But they said in the book of Psalms are all, all the experiences. All. They may, that's, that's just, just this amazing. Psalm is Psalms, um, we're not look at, we're not look at most people in the hospitals read the book of Psalms. Think about that. Well, this particular psalm is Psalm chapter 1. We're going to look at We're not going to look at all the psalms through this, this, this mini series. Why don't you come over to the side, sir? Through this mini series. But uh, we're going to take out different ones and hopefully you can grasp something from them and they can benefit your life because there's going to be some experience you're going to go through that you can go to the book of Psalms and identify with. This particular first psalm is called the genesis of the psalms. It's kind of like what everything is based on. But it's in, in, like in, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and then later on he created man. Well this one starts over with man. Uh, blessed is the man. But this man is not in a garden in the world of a million flowers. But he is among some serious things. This man in the Psalms, Psalm chapter one, is a man that is in the world on the earth. But he is among some serious things. He is among counselors, ungodly counselors. He is among sinners. He is among mockers. So we've got to realize that when it comes down to it, we live in a real world with a lot of stuff that goes by, goes on, and a lot of stuff was taking place here. It's not the figment of our imagination. Now, some people, because of television and because of different things, they live in a fictitious world. You know, I'm kind of coming with the saying, you, you got to fake it to make it. Uh, a fairy tale world. And they live happily ever after. Forever and forever. Ever met those kind of people? Um, we, we go through life and we're not set in with what reality is. So we want to take some of this Psalm, Psalm 1 and give you some highlights. And we see, first of all, there is what is called the search for happiness. Everybody's searching to get happy. For some people, uh, to them to be happy, it means they get a car. For some people, for them to be happy, it means they'll, they'll get a, a house. Uh, for some people to be happy, they are saying, uh, just give them some, a good bit of money. What does it take to make you happy? Ever thought about it? What will it take to make you happy? Uh, maybe, perhaps, you may be thinking, you know, for me to be happy, I would like so-and-so to die. Maybe they may be thinking the same thing about you. Should the Lord answer both your prayers? Blessed, <laughs> happy is the man. But if a man I'm is trying to play being facetious. If you're going to experience happiness, you're going to happiness. Happy. That's what the word blessed means. Don't worry. Blessed, happy. happy is the man. But, but if a man is in search for happiness, if you're going to experience happiness, you know the song came out a few years ago. Don't worry. What does it be happy. Mean? For some children to be happy, they need a body that goes with the toy. It's all a matter of what they think about. What does it take for you to be happy? Scripture says, happy or blessed is the man, someone, that walketh not in the counsel of their God, nor standeth in the way of sin, nor sit in the seat of his counsel. Now basically what is being said here is very, very important. He's trying to get across a simple, simple truth. And I think that it, we, must, we must get across. For you to be happy, there must be some negative in your life, as well as some positive. Hey, that's what makes the car start up. The battery is negative, positive. Like one guy said, if the, if the road up was smooth, you wouldn't have anything. To, to grip That's on. What life the hill, is the hill was smooth. You couldn't climb it. That's a positive thing. But it has some rocks and, uh, and some bumps along the way. You could According move. to the you Bible, now. According to the Bible. And that's what life is all about. There's going to be some negative things. 
and some positive things. And uh, these are the ingredients, according to the Bible now, according to the Bible, what it takes to be happy. Okay, so let's deal with the psalmist comes over here dealing with the negative first. Boy, he shoots right out the blocks with this negative stuff. And he is being strong, and he is being powerful in what he is saying. So let's look at it. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man, the negative thing, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here's some of the things that he does not do. If you plan to be happy, some things you should not do. Notice the expression, walk in. To walk means to, to move about. You can go in and out if you're, you're walking. Yeah, the whole idea is this. Um, trying to get across this. You should not be moving around with ungodly counselors. If you're going to be happy, it's because you are not walking with ungodly counselors. We cannot help ourselves to happiness by being around ungodly, worldly men and women. Now, get the point now. Please, don't misunderstand me. You live in a world of ungodliness. Hello? That's right. You rub shoulders with them every day. You go to the restaurant, you buy food with them. You, um, you on their job, uh, they're there. You're not gonna get away from the worldly man and the worldly woman, okay? This is not having to do with isolation at all. There's a great verse of scripture that I, I, I want you to look at, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Turn it with me. Hopefully you got your Bible. And this verse, uh, you need to mark it. Because I think it speaks volumes concerning our position in the world. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Paul wrote, wrote in verse number 9, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. I notice that statement he made. But then in verse number 10 he said, Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortionists, or with idolaters. For then must he needs go up out of the world. He said, listen, I'm telling you, don't keep that type of company. But I'm not saying that you got to get away from every extortioner, every thief, every robber, every fornicator. I'm not saying that. Because to do that, you got to leave this world. That means that wherever you go, the jobs, the work, the streets, God wants us to Sometimes they don't want to uh, isolate ourselves. They're right there. But the idea is that God wants us to So let's, let's be real. The idea is not that God wants us to, you know, uh, isolate ourselves. But the idea is that God wants us to insulate ourselves. When it comes to the world. Our associates. Who do we associate with? What kind of counselors do you have? <laughs> they are counseling, the world's counseling, their ways, their sins, their seats, and not for us. Their affections are not for us. Now, God says here in Psalm 1, He said, Blessed or happy is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, the ungodly here may be moral. But the point is, if they are ungodly, they are not saved. Very important. Okay? You, you've got to be careful about taking counsel from an unsaved person. Don't you be connected to... And don't Very important. From an ungodly person. Listen to the man. You want to be happy? Don't you walk? Don't you be involved with? Don't you be connected to? And don't you be taking counsel from an ungodly person? The ungodly has as the center of their counseling. Humanistic view, not God's view. Man's view. An ungodly person is going to counsel you based on what they have experienced and what they know. That's it. They cannot counsel you based on the word of God, what God wants, and what the way God operates. They're ungodly. 
And they make statements like, you guys... I listen to the world sometimes as they give their counsel. They're talking to the young men and the young ladies. And they make statements like, you guys should not be practicing unsafe sex. You had unprotected sex. And you listen to that type of terminology and you listen to that type of talk. And you know what you have to say? Ungodly. Because what they are initially saying is this. Oh, it's okay to have sex. Just make sure it's protected sex. And so here's the world who would sell condoms left, right, and center because they're believing in their mind they're having protective sex. And God's word does not teach that at all. That's an ungodly counselor. Because their philosophy is against God. God says marriage is honorable and the bed and the fire, but homeowners and adulterers, God will judge. God says do not commit fornication. He didn't say, don't have protected, don't, don't have, oh, go ahead, have fornication, but be protected. God drew, draws the line at no sex at all, except you are married to that person. That's it, that's God's law. Well, the counselor, the worldly counselor comes along and says, well, you know what? And this is what they're saying in essence. God's stupid. He doesn't know what reality is. See, the reality is, you're going to go ahead and do it. So how a condom on. So they're making God out as if he is stupid. God doesn't know what he's saying. Listen, companies, we need to produce God doesn't know what he's saying. Why is he drawing the line all the way back there? No sex except you're married. God doesn't know what he's saying. Listen, companies, we need you to produce more, more and more condoms because we need to let these folk know they can go ahead and have sex but have it under protection. By the way, I tell you straight off the top when it comes down to that issue. There's no way a condom can protect you from God's judgment anyway. Hello? Yeah. God's ready. He coming down. Now, any person, you can wear a condom or whatever you want to, God will put the judgment down on you. He said in his word, Hebrews 13, 4, it's clear. Marriage is honorable, the bed and the fire in marriage, sex in marriage, great. But hormongers and adulterers, he will judge. Now, hear me. It's very important to understand. That counseling based on the man is wrong. God says, you want to be happy? Do not walk with ungodly counselors. The center of them is man. They think of themselves as this. You know, in the Bible, we have several folk who, who got, and by the way, you got to watch out for even Christian counselors. Because some Christians ain't counseling you based on the Bible. They're counseling you based on their opinion. But this is what I think. This is what I feel. That's stupidness. When everybody can give you counsel, you ask them, what's the scripture principle you use it? If they can't give it to you, don't take it. Because if they got a position and they're doing it right, don't take it. You, you are the wrong person. You say, well, they got a position. I, I don't care if they got a position. You still got the wrong person. Because if they got a position and they're doing it right, they ought to be doing it based on scripture. I know what the Bible teaches that Sarah was a good Not opinion, because opinions can vary. Okay? But the point I'm trying to get across is even Christian counselors you gotta watch over for. I know what the Bible teaches that Sarah was a good was a good woman, you know. Sarah. Abraham's wife. Yeah, they went out. Sarah asked Abraham, said, Now where you going, sir? My husband, where you going? And Abraham said, I don't know. And she said, Okay, I can follow you. So you come to another spot, where you going, Abraham? Um, I don't know. That's why the Bible calls her a woman of faith. She just went along with her. So you may be one who criticized Sarah because Sarah ended up giving Abraham some bad counseling. She said, Abraham, I can't have any children. So my handmaid, you go with her. And the child will be helped. That's what will accept us, the child, for me. That's bad counseling. Bad, 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 bad. That's, that's why the stuff's still going on in the Middle East right now. Ishmael and Isaac still fighting. I want to say, well, boy, you know, Sarah was really a bad counselor. Hey, don't don't criticize Sarah too quick, you know. You, you were willing to follow your husband. Huh? You willing to follow him? 
So don't talk too fast. But the point I'm trying to get, you gotta got watch out. Remember Ray Boat? Jerry Boat? Ray Boat? Solomon said? He got some bad tongues to them. When he should have listened to the younger men, he went and he, he, when he should listen to the older men, he went and listened to the younger men who was his age. Anytime you get in counseling from the same people who young people, young people listen, all of you, when you get in counseling, don't get no counsel from the people who are the same age as you. You better find somebody who wants some gray hair or no hair or something. Or orange hair or white hair or whatever you call that. Don't go for counseling. I see the back there some yellow hair. Can't can't taste it too much out of sentence. You ain't got no hair. All right. <laughs> But the point is this, don't, don't go for counseling with your immediate peers. Don't do that. I'm a pastor. I have men that I would call on for counseling. If I get in a situation, I get in a situation, I call on them. And I say, I need some help. Who don't know God. So you got to learn. Listen, it's important to get some counselors, but don't walk. In the midst of ungodly counselors. That's people who don't know God. You say, well, they have a superior position. Do they know God? That's a problem. I mean, that's it. It's, 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 it's hard enough just operating on your own. But to go to counselors who don't know God, that's a problem. Who are you taking counsel from? Or are you taking counsel from TV? In the movie. Are you taking counsel from people that you have seen in their lives that they have proven God? Or are you taking counsel from TV and the movies and, and self? After some people do, they counsel themselves. They got all kinds of problems there. Rehoboam took the wrong counsel from the wrong men. Jeroboam, he took the wrong counsel, he made two cops. One to the north, one to the south, there's well. The whole kingdom split. Bad counsel. God says, if you don't plan to be happy, listen to me. Listen. Don't walk. Don't be connected with the people who are ungodly counselors. Men that don't know God. Women that don't know God. Or even if they say they know God, they cannot counsel you based on the word of God and they're not giving you scriptural principles. So be careful with counsel. Secondly, if you want to be happy, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners. Standing. The first one has this, this man that wants to be happy, dealing with the negative side. Um, don't walk. Don't be walking up and down with these folk that are ungodly. This one, he says, hey, don't stand. So you see this progression. is the walking. And there's this point when it comes to stop and the standing. Stopping, spending time with the sinners. Who you spend time with? Well, I like trying to be the boss uh, of the job, so I spend time with the boss of the job. Sinners is the next thing. The boss is ungodly. Wrong person. Time, spending time with the sinners. Ungodly counselors is one thing. Sinners is the next thing. The expression for the word sinner has to do with somebody who has missed the mark. In other words, they shot a bow or an arrow. They shot the arrow and the arrow missed the mark. That's what's called sin. Sin is missing the mark. For all have come short. We have all missed the mark of perfection. And since we are no longer, uh, we have, we have missed the mark of perfection, we are called sinners. Sinners. Now, here's what the word of God is saying. While the ungodly may be moral, but lost, the sinners here are people who are practicing being off the mark. As far as life is concerned, they are living sinfully, intentionally. There are some people that are just going to live their sin right in the front of you. They're going to do their thing. God says, don't you stand and get connected with them. Don't you stand and be connected with them. They are practicing their wickedness. They are practicing their sinfulness. There's another verse of scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians. Turn it with me again once you turn it down. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. A very important verse. Uh, I think that when you look at it, you kind of analyze your whole lot of stuff here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 9. Look at this. 
Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you know that? It's question mark. Be the fornicators. Be not deceived. Now get this nail down, ladies and gentlemen. Adulterers. Be not deceived. No abusers of themselves for mankind. Be the fornicators. No idolaters. No adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. God lists a bunch of sins right there. These are these referring to some people who are practicing, who are practicing these things openly. He said, look y'all, these people are not going there. Idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, that's the homosexual. Where the one is the woman. Abusers of themselves and mankind, I believe that has to do with the one that's the male. Nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. He said, don't be around them. Look back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 11, he just said, verse 9, he wrote, and you know, the company of fornicators, where he said, you have gone the way, verse 10. Verse 11 says, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, but now I've written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, with such, and one, no, not to eat. In the council of dead, don't even eat with them! See, when he said, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the one that doesn't know God. Maybe more, but you don't know God. And then he comes back and says, don't even stand, don't stop and stand in the, the way of the sinners. Because that's those said that are outright practicing their sin. You cannot be in cahoots with them. When that's the way they're living, Amen. that's what they operate on. You cannot be in cahoots with them. Jesus, you know one of the great things of life is that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Amen. But you never find where Jesus was in such cahoots with them that he was, you know, dilly dallying and having fun with them. He never condoned their sin. So oftentimes, when he was in the place where the sinners were, the sinners got what? Converted. And listen to me ladies and gentlemen, when you find yourself to the place where your friend, let me raise up, your friend, and it's your friend that's living in sin, doing the right, the wrong things, you know they're doing the wrong things, they're practicing the wrong things, and they're right around you, something is wrong with your Christianity. And they're living in sin! You know, sometimes I meet some folks who didn't come to church for a little while, and they say, hey, where you been? How you this? How you that? And so forth. And, uh, well, you know, uh, coming around. And then you look at them, and you see something's going on. You know what I mean? You know something's going on. And so you try to encourage them to be in church. Now, right on the top, many times you can look and see, hey, something is going on. And in one sense, you could, you could feel good in the sense that they don't believe uh, the way they operate in life, they don't believe that they can live in sin and still be in church faithfully. The most dangerous one is the one who believes they can live in sin and they, they're in the nightclub Saturday night, Sunday morning right in church. Something seriously wrong with them. Okay? But the fact of the matter is this, listen, you cannot be openly, openly practicing sin and, and you be their friend and you connected with them. You, you cannot be standing and stopping and spending time with them. You, you know what you do? You say, well, listen, pop, stop. I, 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 I am a friend. She, she's a fornicator or she is a, 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 a lesbian or whatever. She's a practicing lesbian. She's a practicing alcoholic or whatever the case may be. Or whatever he may be. Uh, you have a friend. You say, but I don't. I don't do that. We, we meet every day and we connect and we have, you know, fun. But I don't do that. That's what she does or that's what he does. But let me tell you something. There's a secret thing in life you didn't understand. How you condone something. You can condone something. You you don't you don't, listen. You don't have to actually 
One of the ways you can condone something to tell a person is okay is by not saying anything about it. Silence isn't gold again. Silence is just plain chicken. You are yellow. condoning it. You are saying it's okay. So you're around the place, you know they're doing it. You have nothing to say. And you just talk to your friends, everything like that. You, you are condoning it. You are saying it's okay. Because if you were to open your mouth and say that's wrong, and you continue that preaching, they might stop or they might leave. But since they feel comfortable around you, they can you, they feel that you are condoning it. You are condoning by your words, or you condone it by your silence. I was reading the article the other day about a, a building that was interesting. They say so many times with the, with the buildings in, in, in our lives, we, we recognize these buildings are put up and we uh, try our best to keep them polished and everything. And while it's standing, um, as it goes for years and years, you, you don't really recognize it sometimes, but the wood is rotting, the building is decaying. It's standing. It's being polished on the outside, but it's still rotting. And so many times in life, that's what it is. Oh, I'm around the the the, the, the adulterer, the fornicator, but I'm not saying anything, so I'm, I'm okay. No, you're rotting too, because you're condoning what's going on. You're not speaking of your presence doesn't mean anything anymore. You come on the scene and say, oh, oh, that's just Mary. That's just Johnny. I can go and continue to do what I want to do because it's doesn't make a difference. Well, when I come to the place, oh Lord God, I shouldn't say that, not when. But if I were to come to the place, and I can be around people and they know how to fear God and how to understand who I am all about, and my presentation of Jesus Christ does not offend them, I think I need to step off the scene. Because it ought to. It ought to, not because I'm a preacher. It ought to because we are Christians. We are Christians. That's, that's the main thing. We're Christians. You know, many times we come to the place where we, um, we, we look at these people, we around them, and, and we, we let things happen, we let things slide. We're endorsing them, we're condoning them, we're telling them it's okay. And, and, and again, I say this, and I say this with a heart of love, God knows my heart, because some of us have made this, the mistakes in the past, right? Where there's adultery, where there's liquor, where there's whatever the case may be, where there's fornication. We've made the mistakes in our past. And our tendency is, because we've made the mistakes, we see Johnny going to make the same mistake, we don't want to say anything to Johnny. I, I, I didn't do it right. You're the very one that should talk to Johnny. Mary? Or Mary. And say, Johnny, Mary, here's what, I did the wrong thing. Good with me, but the reality is, I, I, I didn't do it right, I was wrong, and Mary, you're going to pay because I, it may look like everything has been good with me, but the reality is I'm paying. See, they don't think you're paying because you're walking around it. <laughs> smiling, you know, you pretend that you got to pretend. Oh, you're smiling, so they don't think you're paying. Because they don't hear you say it. You're going to pay for what you're messing up. You don't say to them, listen, things are wrong. You're going wrong. I've already been through this. You're going to mess up. And you're going to pay for what you're messing up. So when people it happens, they don't look at you. We, you know, sometimes we don't realize, they don't realize what they purchase. And stories told about a, uh, an auction they were coming. And there was an auction with a, with a trunk. Trunk. One of the old ancient trunks. <laughs> and they, in essence, said, you know what? This trunk has never been open up. We don't know the trunk is in this place. We don't know what is in it. So is there a bid for the trunk? So some people made a bid. Finally, the one that won the bid, he had it's on, or secured it for $50. Old trunk. Promptly, he pried that trunk open. It was never open. As you know, they were. And what he found? <coughs> Disjointed human skeleton. You can imagine spending fifty dollars for a trunk. You figure there was going to be some treasure in that thing, and it turned out to be skeleton bones. 
Now you can understand how, how upsetting that particular preacher so was. Right? But so it is, ladies and gentlemen. When we discover the real nature of the prizes for which we have gained by sin. Our sin is going to bring us with a prize. And that prize ain't something that you're going to look for so beautiful. You go in that trunk, looking for gold, and you come out with signatures of death. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So listen, you've been really dallying in sin, expect some pain. When you get the pain, don't say, no, I don't deserve this. You deserve it. We deserve it. I deserve it. I'm not going to say, it shouldn't have happened to me. It shouldn't have happened to me. Because I dilly dally. Because you're playing around. It will happen. Don't let anybody fool you. Oh, you can play around and nothing can happen. That's what you're telling people. And you're trying to deceive them that the wages of sin ain't dead. You're trying to tell them that when they sow, they won't reap. You're trying to tell them, well, you sow it, Tom. You, you know the reaping in this life, and if you reap it, it ain't going to be so bad. Listen, when you reap it, it's bad. When you sow it bad, and you reap it bad. So I, I don't want no young boys to look at me and say, you know what? Preacher wasn't straight up with me. And they need to look and hear that from some of you older ones too. Straight up. You talking about being happy? Tell them you ain't happy. Because he or because she Be real. But where to cover up? Where you happy? And then what you gonna say? Because he or because she still liar. You're the problem. Of sinners. And until you get to face that and say, you know what? I did some things. I did some things. I stood. I stood. I was standing in the way of sinners. I was standing with the sinners. I was dealing with them. I was operating with them. He said, you can't be happy when you're taking counsel from the ungodly. You can't be happy when you're standing with the sinners, fellowshipping with them. Standing with them creates doubt sometimes. They are bad associates. Bad associates. We've got to come to the place where we understand God's word, the remedy for happiness is he got some negatives in there. What is negative is, don't be with the ungodly counselors. Second one, don't stand in the way. Don't walk with the counselors, don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't be stopping and standing with them. So here, we start back to Psalm uh, chapter 1. Psalm 1, verse 1. So here he says here, Blessed is the man, or happy is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful. There's some serious progression. But how could a, a person go from walking up and down with them, because you keep on walking with these ungodly counselors, finally you stop, and then you watch people practicing the wrong stuff and you can condone it. And then next thing you end up sitting down yourself. The scorner right there. Scholars are people who make mock of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ain't no God. God can't do nothing. You know, but you stupid following God. And the scholars, you sit down right with them talking, having tea and coffee. How could you fellowship? How could a person come to that place? He says, God says, you want to be happy? Don't get to that level. Don't get to that level. Don't sit in the seat of the scholars. The sit uh, implies acceptance. It's a high level of fellowship. Evil has Known that you know these people and you connect with the people who mock God. Scorn us! They deny God openly. Evil has become their God. Can you imagine Christians fellowshipping with a voodoo man or voodoo woman? How much more evil can you be? How can a Christian, by the way, you know the Christians who go and look up over and voodoo people when they get situations? <laughs> God's judgment call on a Christian. I'm telling you that right now. God says, you know, you don't. You don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Scornful is where it's called for me. It's a mocker. Makes a mockery of God. You know, we've got, and it goes back to the atmosphere we're in sometimes. Sometimes 
the atmosphere we're in is bad atmosphere. Um, they tell us that there's certain fruits cannot grow in the Bahamas, like the, the red apple, so forth, so on. That can't grow in the, because the Bahamas, the atmosphere, the Bahamas does not uh, lend it uh, to be so. Okay, certain things only grow in certain atmosphere. What's your atmosphere that's around you? All right, you, you say, well, I'm going to the nightclub. Well, listen to me. Don't, don't, don't worry about those people. In that atmosphere, there's a veneer, there's a thin covering, there's a, a facade, an empty thing that's being done where they portray themselves to be happy. You see them all going with their music at the same time, and all their lights glittering and flicking and all that kind of stuff, but they ain't happy. You're right. They're not happy. All of them got some kind of scheme going. Everyone. Some guy in there thinking, I can get home with these girls tonight. Some girl in there thinking, boy, I can get with some boy tonight. That's the whole atmosphere of the club. And then all of their scheming trying to, you know, swing somebody for something. And mainly it has to do with sex. Drugs and alcohol and money and... Some people, when they wake up the next morning, they don't know what they did the night before. What's the atmosphere in your life? You're in. There are some guys that the atmosphere of, of the sex talk, where they, you know how it goes. Well, listen, I got this girl, and I got this girl, and I got the next one, and they got their talk going, and you know, hey man, you know, they father and children out of wedlock, and they sexually, they're having fun, and they, they feel good. But let me tell you something, temporary pleasure. You know, temporary pleasure. And like I said earlier, when they open that trunk, they can reap the ravages of sin. The lowest state that a man can go to in sin never brings happiness. As a matter of fact, it's a downward spiral. Walking, standing, sitting. He's reached the lowest end. The more you get the sin, the less happy you're going to be. Nobody can tell you, hey, hey, by the way, the, the porn artists, folks who push him for the way, they ain't happy. Not happy at all. They push him for the way, left, right, and center, and they make him millions of dollars, they ain't happy. Okay? You cannot sit with them. No you cannot agree with them. Gambling. You That's cannot the enjoy their fellowship. Their philosophies are anti God. Because they are the ones who say gay they marriage is okay. It's no God? Thing. That's okay. Gambling? That's okay. Bible says, don't their sit. philosophies don't are anti God. Their lifestyle and speech is intentionally against God. Bible says, don't sit in the seat of the scornful, the mocker. Stephen Lawrence, Steve Lawson spoke on the same subject in Lawson. He said these words, the blessed man refuses ungodly counsel, rejects secular humanism, rejects worldly wisdom and secular thinking. He refutes activities that violate God's word and that contradict God's character. Uh, there's a repudiation of entering into an activity that is contrary to the commandments of God and the pattern of wisdom. The blessed man refuses to adopt to their thinking, refuses to follow their path, refuses to go in their direction, refuses to participate in their revelry, refuses to attend their brawls, refuses to identify with their causes, refuses to associate with their agenda, refuses to laugh at their vulgarities, and refuses to be entertained by their lewdness. You're going to be a godly person. It's not conforming to everything. It's what is called not conforming to those things, but conforming to God. The blessed man is a man that separates himself from their beliefs. The ungodly counsel, the sinners, the mockers, he separates himself from their beliefs, from their belongings, and from their behavior. He keeps a safe distance. Because he guards what he hears. Okay. Blessed man understands bad company corrupts good morals. 
The blessed mind occupied, recognizes you lie down with the dogs to get up with the fleas. The blessed mind recognizes you cannot take fire in your bosom without getting burned. The blessed mind realizes garbage in, garbage out. The blessed mind realizes that the world is his mission field. Oh, he is the mission field of the world. The blessed mind realizes he will soon become like that which he reads and listens to and entertains himself by. So he watches carefully. If you're going to be a blessed man, a real happy man, you've got to separate yourself from these people, the ungodly, the sinners, and the scorners. You can't enjoy fellowship with them. I'm, again, I repeat, I repeat to you the scripture, you must need to go out of the world if you cannot be with them at all. That's not the point. The point is, while you're with them, there's not need to be isolation, but it needs to be insulation. Make sure you're protecting yourself from not getting connected with all the things that they are doing. That world out there is a serious world. They're out to take down every Christian. They're out to rip every girl. Rip every boy. They're about to tear you apart. And all that glitters ain't gold. And go. And sometimes you look at the stars, you say, man, I can be like that one, or I can dress like that one, and I'm going to entertain like that one. All that glitters ain't gold. Let me tell you what you, which star you better be looking at, the star of stars. You better be looking at Jesus. You better look at him for the stand there. You better not be watching what's going on over there. There's some serious. The Bible did say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Huh? The Bible didn't say that. So what, we got to be careful what's going on there. Quickly. Remember the story of the frog in the kettle? Remember that? Yeah, you take the uh, frog, put him in the kettle of cold water. Boy, he's still right around there, swimming around. The fire need that water. As it warms up, he continues to swim around. Swim around. He swims around until he boils to death because his body gets acclimated. Boils to death! Now, if you, if you put the boiling water on and throw him in there, he can jump out. Maybe he's burned, but he would have jumped out. But if you put him in the cold water and boil it, he gets acclimated and pretty soon he's just part of it and he boils to death. You know what happened? Folks, a lot of times, we as Christians, we have become acclimated. Become acclimated to some of these folk that be around. We're not insulated. God says, if you're going to be a happy person, get this negative part of the battery down. For your engine to start, for your car to get going, you got to have negative. Positive. Get this negative down. Do not be with ungodly counselors. Do not stand. Do not sit down right. with the mockers. That's right, Bible. Right. Amen. Right. Say, so get that portion nailed down. Right. Now, say, so let me give you the positive. Verse number two. But, contrast. Psalm 1, verse 2. But, the happy man, got the negative down. Verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Oh, there's so much to say on this. That is a delight, I don't have time to say it all. But I like the first word there. It says, but his delight. Something that is a delight is a joy. Something is, that's a delight is something you enjoy doing. It's a delight to do. You enjoy it. He said, find, if you want to find happiness, he said, you better get to the place where you begin to enjoy the word of God. Mm. Hello? Yep. Now, that's serious stuff. This is a statement that was made. Let me see if I can get it. Our intake and love for the word. Our Christian life, listen to this, will not go beyond our intake and love for the word. So, get this now. 
And, 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 and I know that is, it's tough sometimes. You come to the church service, your body already tired. But there's more pressure on you to one hour of preaching than any other time. It is easier to work for eight hours. There's more pressure. It's called spiritual pressure. It is easier to work for eight hours. Physical work. Than to do one hour of concentrating preaching on the God. And especially if the fellow board. There is a spiritual temperature. There is a spiritual pressure. Why? There is a power. There is a spiritual temperature. There is a spiritual pressure that is placed upon a person not to hear the word of God. Because they can't take the preaching. That's the reason why a lot of the churches have a lot of gimmicks going on. A dance so a this out that Because they can't take the preaching pure, unadulterated preaching. That's right, Pastor. What they want? Give me a little dance with it. Give me a little jump with it. Give me a little entertainment with it. Give me something with it. I just can't be straight on preaching. That's right, Pastor. Preach, preach. That's right. They couldn't have taken Jesus. They couldn't have taken Paul. He didn't have no antics. He didn't have no things, no schemes, no plans, no dance, no nothing. He was just ripping. Just preach. Well, you know, you got to drop a video in here someplace, man. Now listen to me. When it comes down, the Bible says, but his delight. His delight, 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 delight. It means that which he enjoys. That this, this man that's going to be happy, he's got to come to the place where he delights. And the scriptures here is very clear about it. He delights in the law of the Lord. You know what the word law means? It means in the word of God. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's what it means. In Luke 24, verse 20, 44, you'll find that Jesus began to preach, teach unto them, but the end of his resurrection, he's walking. He taught them from Moses, the law of Moses, and from the prophets. And, you know, that's how they divided the Bible. Moses, the book of Moses, law, was not the Ten Commandments. When it said law, it meant the books of Moses. And further on, it meant the entire garment of Scripture. We don't have time to go through and verify that. But the Bible is in essence saying, you're going to be a happy man, you must delight in the law of the Lord. You must delight in the word of God. Oh, you know what it tells me? There ain't no shortcut to the talk for happiness in your life. I know we always got some scheme, you know. That's our society. If you do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do that, this, that, 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 you reach the top. Bang, you're there. When it comes down to happiness, ladies and gentlemen, there ain't no, no shortcut system. System is very simply laid out. Follow God's word. Determined to love it. Determined to eat it. Determined to enjoy it. You say, I don't like it right now. It's okay. You say, I don't eat that much. You know what they used to do when you couldn't never eat much? They force feed you. You ever heard of the man force man? Force feed you and tell you? You get to like it? That's why we tell people, don't give till it hurts. Give till it feels good. You know what I mean? Force feed. But there's some very important things I want to share here. I'm, going to, I'm trying to bring this to close. It says here, his delight is in the law of the Lord. So that's the word of God. So if you want to be a happy person, get into this word. There is no if, ands, or buts about that. Listen, you will not grow. Oh, your growth, your spiritual growth will be in direct proportion to your intake of the word of God. One guy put it this way. You will not grow one millimeter beyond your intake of the word. You're not maturing. Well, I ain't too much of the word, but you ain't too much of the word. The word, the word, that brings growth. 
That means you ain't moving. That's right. You're not maturing. It's the intake of the word, the word, the word that brings growth. And how God put it, you know, so it, the dependent is not on the preacher. Well, it's how the preacher preaches. No, mm -mm, sorry. Excuse God. X. X. It's all dependent on how you intake the word. So your growth is not dependent upon me. Your growth is not dependent upon your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your sister. Your growth is not dependent on your husband or your wife. Your growth is dependent on you, your intake of the word. I'm a Christian. Okay. Christian life is a life of fellowship and it is a life of growth. I'm a Christian. I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I talk with them every day. If you don't have that relationship where you talk with them every day, then maybe you are not saved. That's what Christianity is. It is a fellowship. I do things wrong. I talk to them. I ask them, forgive me. I do things right. And they do some things and they work up and I say, Lord, you are so awesome. You are so powerful. I don't understand why you're doing this. Man, this is... What is it? So many times I'm saying good hey, I don't even deserve this. Because I have a relationship. I talk with him. I'm, I'm expecting to, to connect with him and to meet with him and to talk. Listen, that's the fellowship every one of us is supposed to have. You're not supposed to come to church here. I come to church and hopefully God may speak today. He, he should have spoken to you for the ministry of God. He should have spoken to him and said, Good morning. Lord, thank you for giving me life. Talk this and that and all that. And you, he started speaking to you right then. He gave you some kind of intake of his word. And he started speaking right then. By the time you get to the church service, you know God already spoke to you. It is a fellowship. You're just trying to see what, what he gives the preacher to give to you to. But you done got some stuff your own because you met with God. That's what Christianity is. It is a fellowship. Grow in grace. Of a relationship. Grow in grace or you will grow in It is a growing process. In 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace. Someone say you grow in grace or you will grow in disgrace. It is law. So he delights in the law. And in the law, you think about the word of God. And in his law, he does this verse 2 is very powerful. And the Bible says, in his law. So he delights in the law. And in the law, as he enjoys the law. And in his law, he does meditate day and night. Wow. Now, let me just say something about this meditation. And then I'm going to try to wrap it up. Because I, I think it's a very important to understand what God talks about meditation. There was an article, a gentleman had written, boy, and I thought it was just, just, you know, the expression is off the chain. Let's begin by saying this, the word meditation. Let's see if I can give that to you. Begin by saying this, the word meditation has an antique, says here, old world flavor about it. And as though it belongs to an age when men took slow, measured strides and wheels of time move leisurely. How many of us meditate? Meditate! Stop! Hold the mind before a subject until it becomes steeped in it, saturated with it, through it, through and through. Meditate! Stop! Look, analyze, ruminate. Looking at this thing, God says the happy man is a man who delights in the law of God and meditates in the law of God. He's going through it. The article continues. We live in an age of mental haste and gallop. Impressions are abundant. Convictions are scarce. Go to the academy. In any of the summer months, and see how the crowds gallop around the galleries, hastily glancing at the hundreds of pictures which adorn the walls, with the result that memory retains nothing in distinction, but only a recollection of masses of color in endless confusion. So we say, listen, go to the, you know, the, the, the 
artistic gallery of art and whatnot. See people just walking around saying, oh yeah, that's a nice picture, it's a nice thing, that's a nice work. At the end of the day, you ask and say, what did you learn from it? Well, there's a lot of pictures. And there's so a lot of things. So that's how we are with the Word of God. We don't meditate. But, it goes on and says here, they only have a recollection of the masses of color and endless confusion. How is it? How is it with the art student though? And you just go in in general in this, in these photo places, but the art student, when he goes there, he goes early in the morning, he selects his picture, he sits down before it, he studies it, it's perspective, it's grouping, it's coloring, the artist's mannerism, every line, every light, and shade, he meditates upon it. The picture becomes imprinted on his mind and educates his taste. It steals into his own soul and afterwards imperceptibly influences his own pencil and brush and becomes part of the man forever. Think about that when it comes to our Bible. Getting before it, analyzing it, looking at it, and then all of a sudden this book becomes so real, it becomes a part of your life forever. He talks about, he goes on to say as well, in the four Gospels, we have four picture galleries. And the different pictures are different phases of the mind of Christ. Christ is depicted in different attitudes and conditions. Alone, on a mountain at prayer, in the midst of a vast, inquisitive multitude, in the severity of temptations in the wilderness, in a quiet home at Bethany, facing the cross, the triumph of Calvary. The real steward, the real disciple of the master, wants to know the mind of his master. He sits down before one picture at a time, lingers before it, studies every line and features of it. Beauty after beauty breaks out upon his delighted vision. He meditates upon it, and the beauty of the picture steeps into his soul, refines his moral uh, taste, influences his hand and heart, and becomes part of himself forever. Listen, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When you meditate upon Christ, you see the beauty of Christ, and so very often you do not see the full beauty of God on the surface. You must meditate. You must go beyond. You must take time to study, to listen, to look at what he said, and then he becomes a part of you, and then he begins to activate himself through you. One thing about meditation, meditation always brings activation. You don't meditate and keep it to yourself. You meditate and it becomes a part of the way you live and a part of the way you operate, the part of the way you organize and the part of what you want about because you've been meditating, you've met God, you talk with him, you connect with him. It's Moses in the very bush. It's Moses meeting him. He saw the fire, but then he heard the voice of God. And after he heard the voice of God, he said, I got to do something. I just met God. I know who he is. He is and he goes up and he affects the entire world and he affects the nation and he affects his people saying, I just met God. Amen. Amen. Meditation. The Bible says, you want to be happy? <coughs> Meditate in his word. Day and night. How will your thoughts go? You want to know whose thoughts? Well, you know what they did to me. I can't wait. This is a sad place I go with. But you know what? It's always going to be sad. You learn to meditate. You learn to get below the surface. You'll be excited because God is going to teach some lessons. And God is going to work some lessons. You're going to realize that sovereign God is in charge of everything. And you could be at peace no matter what. They're about to take your neck off and you're at peace. Because you've met God. You know who he's all about. You say, you don't know my life preacher. I'm so frustrated with what's going on. Well, hey, guess what? I know your life better than you think. I can just tell you, you just haven't been meditating. You're an unhappy person. I don't have time to finish the message. The Psalm 1 verse 3 says, and he shall be like a tree. Good night. Now that's loaded. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick that up. Uh, you know the interesting thing about this tree? Verse 3 says, and, and he shall be like a tree planted 
by the rivers of water. And you know what it says? He should be like a tree planted. You know what this means? Transplanted. That means somebody plant the tree there. By the rivers of water means one river could go dry, next river right there. Oh, we ain't, we ain't getting into this one here. What God works is so wonderful that regardless of what you're going through, you go through the deepest hurt, the deepest pain in this life. If you're planted by the rivers of water, <laughs> your leaf, ain't the river. Your life, your testimony, it's going to soar. Everybody else leaves you in brown and the brown patch. Yes, yes, yes. And they're supposed to look at us and say, how in the world are you yes, making sir. it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you making it? Because yes. you're planted. Amen. Amen. You're planted by the rivers. Amen. Amen. You know where your roots go in. Yes, yes. Bible says, listen, where's the scripture in the book of Psalm? Psalm 98, I think, I forgot to talk about too. I uh, said, they are planted in the house of our God. Oh boy. Where are you planted? We don't have time to build that message to be able to put you like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. And it says that bring forth his fruit. Not a fruit. Not Johnny fruit. Not Mary fruit. Guess what fruit you're going to bring forth? Your fruit. In your season. So you don't have to worry about um, what's going on with Henry Garcia, boy. He, he just struck gold. Boy, that's great, eh? I don't know what happened to me. You don't have to worry about that. Your season, God says in your season. But the question is, are you a blessed man? What about these negatives? Have you gotten them taken care of? What about these positives? Are you putting those in your life? Are you delighting in the word of God? If you haven't been, then I say you need to do that. You need to come to the place where you say, okay, God, help me. Help me to, to get into your word. Help me to meditate on the word. We're going to pick up the meditation a little bit deeper. Help me to look and to see you to stop. By, by the way, this all implies this, folks. Listen to me. This implies you've got to get away and be alone with God. Hey, with these children 24 7. Well, that's the problem. You're with the children 24 7. You should be with God 24 7. And I only have a few minutes for God. Oh, that's your problem. That's your major problem. And it ain't John Brown, it ain't marriage too. It's you. Because you ain't with God. Because if you get a hold of him, and you start getting by yourself, and you start seeing the beauty of him, and enjoying the beauty of him, and his beauty affects your beauty, and his beauty affects your life, and your action, and your attitude, and everything, because you met with him, you're like, wow, this is great. One thing you can know, getting into meditation is hard, but once you get in, it's sweet.